Hello, everyone. Happy Monday. Welcome back to Keyshot World 2020. This is week two. For those of you who are with us uh, last week, thank you for joining us. For those who may be new this week, welcome. We're having a lot of fun over here. Uh, I'm Derek Cicero. I'm Vice President of Products uh, and Strategy here at Luxion. Uh, we're very delighted to dig in here. Got a lot of good stuff come up this week. Uh, on deck today, we've got two material sessions coming. And we're also going to announce the winner of our uh, render contest. I've been with, with uh, the great folks at Render Weekly uh, later today. So for our two sessions today, we're doing Materials Advanced. Uh, that's going to kind of go through Material Graph, Tune, uh, cut away all the great materials that we have in uh, KeyShot and how to uh, edit those. We're coming back at noon today, Pacific time, to jump into real cloth, fuzz, and scan materials. Uh, it's its own session. A lot of questions on how to unlock the power of real cloth and fuzz. So definitely come back uh, today at noon. Both of these are going to be done by uh, Kareem Merchant and Soren Gallimark. So thank you to both of those gentlemen for joining us today and putting these together. Um, there is content associated with both of these. So uh, if you go to our homepage, you'll see where it says view details and agenda right there. You click on that link, you go down to the agenda and it says, of content. They're both under 200 megabytes, so you can literally download them uh, as I'm talking right now. So you can download them and follow along uh, and learn. So uh, for the week ahead, you got a lot of good stuff. Like I mentioned, today we're doing two sessions on materials. We're coming back tomorrow for one session. We're going to dig into model sets and studios, so that's going to be really informative. Coming back on Wednesday for two sessions on lighting. So we're going to do lighting essentials and lighting advanced. Uh, and that's going to kind of wrap up our sessions. Coming back on Thursday and doing a designer roundtable. So that's going to be fun. That's going to feature a lot of different speakers we've had uh, over the course of it. We're going to talk about uh, you know, what we liked, what we learned, talk about key shot, where, where things are going uh, in the design visualization space. So, and that's going to how, how we're going to wrap up our nine days of key shot world uh, virtual edition for key shot nine. Uh, as always, if you missed any of our sessions, you can go on the agenda page and watch them. Uh, also, if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, it will notify you when we have new content out there. And so we're pushing new content out there all the time, um, obviously a, a ton uh, these days, but even in the future, we're always putting up quick tips, all kinds of fun stuff on there. So I would definitely recommend you subscribe to our YouTube page. Um, so also want to uh, remind folks that if you are working from home and need assistance with a home license, you can contact your sales rep. We're happy to help you out. If you don't know who your sales rep is, you may always contact sales at luxion.com. Uh, so the render weekly contest, uh, you know, we did the shader ball. I was going through it last week. I was going through it this weekend. I, I, I gotta say, you know, I, I love these contests because the stuff that you guys come up with is so creative and so awesome. Um, so we're gonna wrap up to, uh, this week's contest today. We're gonna announce the winner at three o'clock today on the Render Weekly Instagram. We're gonna, we had so much fun, we'll do another contest. We're gonna start another contest, gonna start today and run through next Monday. And that will also get a key shot license. Um, and so we're gonna do this time, you have to grab one item from the Keyshot Cloud model library. If you go on the Keyshot Cloud, lower left-hand corner, click on the cool little cloud button, it'll pop up the window, you'll see the models. It could be in the foreground, the background, whatever you want to do, you can kind of hide it if you want to, but we just want everyone to kind of have a little fun with the model library. So that contest is going to kick off today, go through next week. So if you missed the last one, uh, jump into this one or do both. It's just a fun time. Um, <clears throat> speaking of cool prizes, the wonderful people at Stanley Black & Decker have given us a prize today to give out, as always, as you know by now, in the second session. That's a Craftsman drill, so it's going to be a two-set two, two, uh, two drill, and a DeWalt walkie-talkie set. So that's going to be super cool. That's coming later today uh, after session number two. But with that, let's dig into session number one. This is advanced materials. So like I said, going through tune, going through cutaway, going through material graph uh, with Soren and Kareem. Going to be fantastic. Uh, come back again at noon for more. And with that, gentlemen, please take it away. All right. Good morning, everyone. Let me make sure this is off right here. Thank you, Derek, for that spectacular intro. Welcome all, and thanks for dropping in on today's advanced materials workshop. As Derek mentioned, my name is Kareem Merchant. I'm one of the creative specialists here at Luxion, based out of our Orange County, California headquarters. A little bit about myself. I'm a recent industrial and product design grad from Art Center College of Design in Pasadena. Since graduating, I've worked as a freelance industrial designer and my current role as a creative specialist here at Luxion. I started using Keyshot just after Keyshot 6 release and I've since adopted it as my product biz program of choice. And in my current position, I've had the good fortune to dive into Keyshot, 
spend a significantly higher amount of time with the program and I'm constantly amazed by just how much customization and flexibility it's offered me. I know many of you are curious about the desktops we use here. Uh, in the studio, we have a beast of a machine from Main Gear. It's running an AMD Ryzen Threadripper 2990WX with 32 cores at three gigahertz. It has an NVIDIA Titan RTX GPU on board and 128 gigs of RAM. Uh, it's running Windows 10 Pro as well. If you're looking for a render rig, definitely stop by Main Gear's website and take a peek at what they have to offer. So in this workshop, Soren and I will be going over some of the more interesting advanced materials that we have at our disposal within KeyShot and covering some use cases for each. Uh, I'll also spend time discussing methods for incorporating these materials into your product visuals. The main focus of this workshop will be covering materials such as cloudy plastics, multi-layered optics materials, scattering medium, as well as implementing cutaway and tune materials in your KeyShot projects. I'll finish up our materials portion with a little overview of our two newest material editions, Real Cloth and Fuzz, which I think you're really going to enjoy playing with if you have not already done so. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about Real Cloth and Fuzz, definitely stop in on our Real Cloth and Fuzz workshop this afternoon. I'll then cap it all off by covering how to access materials through KeyShot Cloud, uh, touching on multi-materials and jumping into the material graph to demonstrate some of the editing capabilities you have within it. We're gonna be covering a fair bit of info in this workshop, so please bear with me. If you have questions, I'll be happy to demo solutions at the end of the presentation, but in the meantime, feel free to ask away in the Q&A panel where we have a few of our Lexion staff members answering questions. On that note, let's jump into our Tech Talk segment with our, one of our lead software engineers, Soren Gommelmark. Soren, why don't you jump in and introduce yourself? Thank you, Karim. So let me just grab the screen. Yes, so as Karim was telling you, my name is Søren Gammelmark and I'm one of the engineers, software engineers on Keyshot. I have a background in physics, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the materials in Keyshot and why they look the way they do in the real world. Uh, let's see, whoops, like this. The real world has many different kinds of materials with varying levels of complexity. Here, I have shown you a small list of material types. Some of these we can deal with in KeyShot already, but some are yet to be done. Rough surfaces you're all probably familiar with, and scattering media or translucent materials such as skin or milk or candle wax, they all gain their appearance from light interacting with the interior of the object. And coated materials are interesting as well. They get their color from interference effects caused by structures on the surface. And this is also what you see on CDs, for example, where the color is coming from small microstructures in the surface, as well as the morpho butterfly, where the wings get the color from small nanoscale structures on the surface rather than some pigment or dye. Many of these materials are interesting. Some of them we can do, some of them we cannot yet do. But at Luxion, we are dedicated to achieving an accurate visualization of materials when needed, and which is also why we have been bringing some of the more complex materials into Keyshot and updating the existing ones. And we will continue to do so in the future. Let's first have a quick look at rough surfaces. This type of surface has been available in Keyshot for a long time, and you're all probably fairly familiar with it. You all know how an ideal specular reflection looked like um, when you uh, looked in a mirror, uh, you see this perfect specular reflection. So perfect specular reflection was actually fairly well understood a thousand years ago, originally most well described by a Persian scientist, but the accurate computation or model of how the color depends on the angle was first assembled in 1829 by the French physicist Fresnel. And basically the law says that light leaves the same angle that it enters on a reflection. So a rough surface is basically a collection of many small randomly oriented micro facets that are all perfectly smooth. So even though the individual facets are perfectly smooth, they give rise to the smooth, diffuse, more diffuse like glossy reflection. So when light enters and is scattered, it's scattered in more than one direction due to the randomness of the surface. It's actually fairly much the same as a bump map, but we handle it in a statistical way where we also can take like different micro shadows, occluding or shadowing each other. Another type of material we've had in Keyshot for quite a long time is the translucent or scattering media materials. We've continuously updated these um, 
And what makes these special is that not only does the light interact with the surface, but it also bounces around many times inside the object. And this is very apparent if you look at, for example, uh, candle wax, where uh, in this example, you have some light being emitted from the flame and hits the surface of the wax. And then it enters deep into the wax and bounces around a lot of times. And then it exits at a position far away from where it entered. Both the rough and the translucent materials treat light as a line or a particle, if you want it, like a single ray of light carrying some light energy. But in reality, light is actually a wave. And this is, so this description of light as a straight line is only true if we look at long distances. But if we zoom in very closely, we get a picture that's more relevant for the coded materials. So these materials consist of many layers of very, very thin materials. And these very thin material layers interact in a way that changes the optical properties of the material significantly. And we added this because many of our customers use optical components in their products. And if you want to visualize correctly the color shift or the changes in color, depending on the viewing angle and more complex materials, you need to handle this correctly. So these coatings, a very thin layer. So you can see I've written 10 nanometers and a nanometer is a billionth of a meter. And in contrast, a human hair is about 50,000 nanometers thick. So these layers are super thin. And what's happening is that when light hits the surface, it is refracted into the layers and reflected again, but it happens so on all the different layers and many times. And in order to accurately compute the color of the reflected light, we need to take all these things into account. To make matters more complicated, these different reflections are different for different wavelengths of the lights of different light colors. To understand this a little bit more into detail, consider just a beam of light that hits a single thin layer. So here, the light is entering and light is a wave. So I've shown an example of how the incident light wave could look like. When it's reflected from the surface, it's reflected as basically the same wave, but with the slightly reduced amplitude, which is because the reflection uh, also causes some of the light to be transmitted inside. But the refracted component also reflects at the bottom and being and refracts out of the medium again. And this causes the first reflected and the second reflected ray to travel different distances. So that means that the second, so the, the part of the ray that enters the layer and leaves it again is slightly delayed compared to the first one. And when you add these two effects up, you get what's called interference. And what's happening here is that when you add these two together, if the uh, high values align, the high values of the first reflected ray align with the high values of the second reflected ray, you get what's called constructive interference and the reflected intensity is increased. But if the high values align with the low values of the refracted ray, you get destructive interference. So the reflected amplitude is decreased. And this latter effect is what's used in anti-reflection coding. And since the delay depends on the path length into the medium and also the wavelength of light, it's very sensitive to both the wavelength of the light, but also the angle of incidence. To see this in effect, I rendered a couple of images in Keyshot. Oh, I forgot to mention here, this uh, for different colors, the delay is different. So I just illustrated this with a different reflection component. But I rendered this image in Keyshot. So it's basically just a standard piece of uh, glasses and the lenses are just a completely standard dielectric material in Keyshot. I also put a very powerful bright pin on the environment and you can see this strong reflection on standard glass. If, however, you put a multi-layer optics material on it with a an anti-reflecting coating, you get something like this. And you can clearly see that the reflected component is much reduced. So actually, even though the reflectivity of the first case is only 4%, so only 4% of the incident light is reflected, it's very, it's actually quite a lot for optical components, 4%. So with the anti-reflection component, this reflected intensity is decreased significantly. And what's going on here is exactly that roughly the yellow light is destructively interfered with the very thin coating on top of it. You can use this in many interesting ways. For example, here is a crazy example where there's both dielectric materials and metals in place 
in the different layers of the thin films. Um, and this gives rise to this crazy rainbow colored effect. And this effect is often used to create iridescent paints that you sometimes see on banknotes or similar. So the very attentive listener will ask, why do we not see these colors when you just look through a window? You're familiar with soap bubbles where you see these colors, but why don't we see it for normal bubbles of water? So that's a bit weird. But the answer lies in the fact that light is actually not a perfect wave. It has noise associated with it. So actually a light wave might look more like this. And you can actually see the effect here on this image from Wikipedia. It's something called Newton rings. And these two, this is two pieces of glass that's assembled together with a very small air gap that increases away from the center. And you can see these color effects at one point and you can see the color effect start oscillating and the distance between them gets smaller and smaller and they get more and more blurred. And that's because the noise becomes more and more important as the light travels further and further inside these thin uh, media. And in the end, when the noise is too much, uh, everything averages out and you just get white reflection and white transmission. And I, just because I'm a physicist, I want to show you this image. image. And what's shown here is some white light hitting a dispersive prism. So the first prism here that light hits is just a normal dielectric material with a fairly low Abbey number, which causes high dispersion. So the light is refracted into multiple wavelength components. And that's the caustic you see on the ground leaving the first prism. But then the second one has a specific type of coating that tends to reflect the blue light, which is the high frequencies or the low wavelengths. And it tends to transmit the red light, which is the long wavelength part. And, and you can actually see this with caustics directly inside Keyshot. This is directly from Keyshot. There's no cheating involved. And I find that very amazing that you can do this with this material. So I hope you got a little bit of insight into how these materials work in the real world. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of teaser for the next session where I'm going to go a little bit into cloth and why it looks the way it does and what's unsolved issues in Keyshot for now and what we're trying to do to improve it. And that's it for me. And I leave it to you, Karim. Incredible as always, very informative. Thank you, Soren. Uh, hopefully that's given you guys a bit more information and background on some of our advanced materials that we're covering today. And now that we've got that background, let's start looking at some of our materials. To kick it off, we're going to discuss cloudy plastics. Uh, the cloudy plastics material option in Keyshot utilizes light scattering particles to replicate complex scientifically accurate materials such as polycarbonate or ABS. Uh, within the material adjustments, you can control parameters such as light transmission, roughness, refractivity, and transparency or cloudiness. When applying cloudy plastics to objects, components, or surfaces, you can either select from different preset materials that can be found in the materials tab of the library panel, or you can change your material type in the material type dropdown. Uh, if you'd like to explore other cloudy plastic options, you can also access different materials that are available through the Keyshot Cloud. If you're looking to speed up render times for quick design comps, enabling the new denoise feature works particularly well with cloudy plastics as well. On this slide, we have an example rendering using cloudy plastics on the left and a screenshot of its corresponding settings on the right. In this image, you can also see some of the adjustment parameters available within the property subtab of the project panel. As I mentioned a moment ago, denoise is a great option for quick comps. However, your fine surface texture information may be subdued or washed out uh, due to the manner in which denoise works. If you find that your surface detail is compromised due to the denoise function being toggled on, uh, try increasing samples a bit to bring out more detail in your scene or try using traditional settings as well. Uh, if you'd like to render out a non-denoised image at the same time, you can always select the raw pass setting under the layers and passes dropdown of the output menu. Uh, for best results with cloudy plastics, I like to render using caustics and global illumination to force light to scatter a little bit more realistically through my cloudy plastic materials. Uh, however, the end result, as well as render time, will be highly dependent on your current hardware. And I did want to make another quick comment on denoise before we move on, since I'm sure many of you are working from home at this point, just like myself. Uh, I just wanted to say how much it's helped me speed up rendering images locally. I'm turning around some really high quality images in just a few minutes using denoise with both CPU and GPU. 
Uh, so if you have Keyshot 9 and you have not been using it, I highly recommend that you do. As you can see here, this is five samples without denoise and this is five samples with denoise. Both of those took about five, 10 seconds to, to render out. So it's, it's a pretty powerful tool. The next material I'd like to discuss is multi-layered optics material. If you open the materials tab in the library panel, you have access to several preset multi-layered optics materials that you can drag and drop onto your projects. Essentially, multi-layered optics represents plastics or glass that have had a layered coating applied through vacuum deposition or a sputter coating process. Uh, if you're a snowboarder or you wear glasses, you're most likely familiar with the coatings that are applied to the lenses to reduce glare from interior lights or reflections from fallen snow. Uh, typically, these coatings create color effects on the lenses that are dependent on coat thickness, type of coating, and angle of light refraction. These types of coatings are most commonly seen in lens applications, but also work really well when creating realistic lighting effects in scenes uh, in elements like bubbles in a kitchen or bath, as well as replicating oil slicks and puddles, for instance, on the street. Uh, they can also be used to create interesting effects on any glass, plastic, or crystal-like material. One of the most notable users of multi-layered optical coatings on product applications is Oakley, who was also a major contributor in the development of Keyshot's multi-layered optical materials, and they are exclusive to Keyshot. On this slide, you can see two examples of multi-layered optics being applied to a model. The first is a more typical application on a pair of snowboarding goggles. You can see how the light reacts to the material by creating an array of visible colors as it, as it put, passes through the plastic face. Uh, the second image was made by Resitari, our resident graphic designer, who used the multi-layered optics material as a means to create uh, some unique surface effects on a more sculptural model. I'm actually gonna open up that model of the goggles for you here, which I have in that file if you've downloaded so you can follow around. I'm not a scientist, so I don't actually know what all the chemicals are causing in the nanometer thickness, but I do know that it's extremely fun to play with. You can see here on the materials that I have several refractive index worth of, of coatings that are on this set of goggles. And down here, I can adjust the layer thickness, the refractive index, and I can adjust the colors as well. And you can see here that by adjusting this layer thickness and the refractive index of different elements, like you can really change the colors that are, are coming through. Um, and if you noticed on that scene from my actual presentation, uh, that was also used with the multi-layered optics. If you want to drag and drop presets, they're over here in the materials tab in the library panel. And you got several options, some that are significantly higher reflectivity than others, um, some that are a lot clearer and you can see through. But this is, is a great way to create interesting effects, like I said, with bubbles, oil slicks, uh, makes it a lot more realistic, especially if you're using lenses, these are like invaluable. Um, something that, that uh, Ryan actually brought up, I have it here on the grid view, but you can't really read what's going on. So list view really helps with that. You can see everything in its entirety and decide what you wanna use. But that's a great tool. Uh, the file is there for you if you wanna play around with it and just experiment, jump around, move your refractive index around, grab different, different uh, coatings, you know, even the glass and, and see what you can do because there's a lot of interesting effects that can be achieved with that. Another interesting material application within Keyshot is scattering medium. Here we have two examples of scattering medium. On the left is an image by Esben Oxholm and on the right is an image by Ryan Levy, our global training specialist. Uh, both of them are using the scattering medium to create this volumetric lighting. In this instance, it's kind of emanating from the, the headlight here and you can see it scattering through the scene versus here it's kind of a spotlight effect on an object. It makes a really dramatic scene as well. Ooh. With scattering medium, you can simulate particle scattering effects such as fog or smoke and can create volumetric lighting such as visualizing rays of light passing through a window or a vehicle's headlight shining through fog. Uh, it can also be used to create unique effects such as foam or sponge-like materials as well. To use scattering medium, you can start by applying one of the preset options directly from the materials tab in the library panel. There you'll find a selection of preset scattering media effects to choose from. You can also select the material you want to apply the effect to and through the material type dropdown, select the scattering medium option from the advanced materials that are available. 
Uh, in the property sub tab, you'll also be able to control the transparency, density of your application, as well as colors and particle effects. Other interesting effects with scattering medium include the ability to add textures to your volumetric lighting, as well as constrain volumetric effects within a volume map. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and open up as been seen, so I can show you that as well. Let me actually pause this real quick. All right, so here's as been seen, something that he set up for, and, and, and you can see here that there's a texture to the smoke or fog that exists in this scene. And let's go here and open up the scene tree. So I have scattering medium fog. This is what was preset. You can actually download this from our scenes as well on our website. Um, and you can, let me click on that and open up the material graph. So you can see here that it's attached to the surface and we have noise texture coming through, which is creating that. If you want to drag and drop a material, you can just come over here, open up scattering media from your materials tab in your library panel, and you have a couple preset options, uh, scattering medium, fog basic. Uh, we're using the textured right now, but this is how you can create like some really cool foams and uh, different effects that'll like, let's drop that in there. So you can see kind of blue coming through what looks to be uh, kind of a bubble surface at the top there. Now, in order to apply your scattering medium, you're gonna need to create geometry to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and hide that. And if you, you can either create the geometry pre previous to pulling it into Keyshot, or you can use the models and the geometry that's there, which is what I like to do. I'll just pull in a cube over here and drop it into the scene. And there you go. Now you can't see anything. It's, it's, it's there in the center. It's just covered up because the cube is actually taking up all the space. But now I can go over to my materials tab. I'm going to pick the scattering medium fog texture and I'm gonna go ahead and I'll just drop it in right here. And you can see now that we're getting that scattering medium effect. It's really got the image subdued in the background, but that's because we haven't really adjusted anything yet. So I'm gonna double click that and go into my material tab in the project panel. Now to change your ability to see through, you can adjust your transparency distance and your density. Transparency distance obviously is gonna let you see deeper into your effect, while density is going to control how tight the particles are to one another. So I'm just gonna adjust that transparency distance. I'll reduce the density a bit. And then you can see that it, it's coming through a lot more clearly than it did a second ago. I can even pull that down a little bit more. Um, and when you're in here, you can look at some of your advanced materials as well, which you see here. Albedo is gonna, control the color of your actual particles. So you can choose some interesting effects depending on what you're going for and put the, make those particles uh, be whatever color scheme that you'd like using the albedo. Uh, scattering directionality and samples as well will increase your, your effect. Uh, one thing that's interesting to use is the multiple scattering. Uh, I don't personally put it on too often, but if you're using it, you can see that it's really casting light from particle to particle. So the scene is having light dispersed throughout it rather than directionally on the actual cube itself. So that's really gonna come down to the look you're going for um, and, and if you want that to be the case. It's gonna increase the amount of render time because obviously there's a lot more going on similar to caustics. So that's, uh, that's our volumetric lighting right there. Let's jump back in. Now let's talk about cutaway. Uh, two more great materials that come in handy during the product development process are cutaway materials and tune materials. Cutaways are particularly useful when creating engineering-based images or renders that demonstrate how product internals are packaged within a housing and can be used to efficiently communicate engineering elements as well as component interactions. They can be used in still image renders as well as animations and they allow you to isolate specific elements of interest within your scene. Typically, uh, uses involve products and other industrial design related projects, but cutaways can also play a role in architectural and environmental renderings to show isolated interior features within a larger space. To create a cutaway, you first need a piece of geometry to do the cutting. You can either import that geometry or simply drag and drop a piece of geometry from the models tab. Uh, and then you can then apply your cutaway material from one of the preset options in the materials tab. You can also select your model, open the material type drop down in the project panel and choose cutaway from there. With the material selected, your model can be capped in four different ways, which you can actually see along the bottom here. We have some examples. Uh, you have no caps, which leave geometry open, inherit caps that cap with the same material as the part that's being cut away, 
Color caps, that cap using a selected color or cap material, which allows you to dictate the material you're capping with. Applying preset caps from the cutaway material option in the library panel will also let you apply, I believe there's two of them that have cross hatching if you wanted to create a cross hatch surface. Uh, you can also exclude certain elements of your model from being cut if you add them to the exclude objects list in the project panel, which you can see that's kind of what's going on over here. I'm gonna open up that scene that's up here as well so I can show you a little bit about that. Again, all these scenes you guys can follow along if you download them. This is actually a demo scene, so if you open it up, uh, you can just pull that from the demo. Uh, right now, he's got a color cap going on over here. If we actually look at this cube, I can shut it off and you can see that the whole differential is there. Basically, what's happened is that a square similar to uh, the volumetric lighting in scattering media was applied and then a cutaway material from the material tab was applied to that piece of geometry and you can see the presets that we have here. So you can do a lot with that. It really depends on what you're going for, the look that you're going for. I'm gonna go ahead and move this real quick. So you can see how, how it cuts. Like you could do a partial cut to, to show the differential. You can cut everything if you want as well. Uh, however, in this case we have Oh, let me double click on this. We have the components in the center which have been bunched together right here. They're under the exclude objects list. So right now we're not cutting those. And I can delete that so you can see how that looks. Right with the, with the color, let's actually drop inherit caps on there and see what happens. Oh, my bad. So now we have inherit caps it's actually using the material to cut away. And, and you take away that material. Obviously this isn't perfect, especially if you're trying to show the actual internals there. Uh, but if your goal is to cut away everything, then this is awesome. Uh, if you do want to show some materials not being cut away, you just have to go in, add them to your exclude objects list, choose what you want excluded and hit OK. And there you go. They pop up. It's a really useful tool, especially when you're getting there at the end and trying to show how uh, uh, the mechanics of an object work or how uh, internals are packaged. It's extremely useful and it's really easy to use, especially with these, these presets, it makes it just drag and drop. Again, go to models, geometry, pull in whatever shape geometry you want to do the cutting and apply that material and you're good to go. All right, so let's go back. The next one I wanna talk about is tune material. Tune is a key shot material type that allows you to create stylized renderings that consist of outlines and fill colors. Using a tune material can be a great way to create engineering based images, uh, as well as instructional drawings, graphics for packaging, or quick design comps. Uh, they allow you to show ideas without textural or material information, as well as create really easy orthographic representations of your projects. Using tune materials for design comps can be extremely useful early in the development process when your goal is to communicate design intent and not get caught up with the materials or textures. You can choose from 25 different preset tune materials within the materials library or start from a blank slate using the material dropdown in the project panel. Uh, when applied, you can control these elements such as color, transparency and contour lines, as well as a series of advanced options that give you control over contour lines and shading effects. And that is also another file that I have open here. So you can see what's going on. I have several tune materials applied uh, to give you an idea of what it could look like. It, it's really a useful tool when you don't wanna get caught up in materials. Uh, you can also show engineering drawings if you come over here to transparency. Right now it's at zero, but if I turn that transparency down, you can see that it becomes see-through. So if there's product internals in there and you wanna create a kind of a graphic, uh, you know, I, I know there's a lot of packaging that uses that or even instructional stuff like uh, Ikea's type of instructionals that come with their products. It's, it's a great way to show that. And then your contour width, let me actually turn that transparency back down. Your contour width will show kind of like how much outlining is occurring. You can see that I'm getting some really thick lines coming in there. And the contour width is automatically set to pixels. So you can create like a really cool sketchy feel that works well when you aren't trying to show like the final idea. It's a, it's a great tool. Uh, you can adjust your contour angle, which will show how much actual inform surface information is being pulled through. You can kind of see it disappearing and reappearing there and then shadow strength will increase and decrease the shadows of your actual material. So you can completely make it flat uh, or you could 
you know, blast it and have it really deep shadows as well. So it's a really useful tool, definitely something to play around with, really, really fun. Let me go ahead and pause that and we'll jump over here. The two final materials I'm going to be speaking about today are real cloth and fuzz. Currently, I've been obsessed with how easily both materials allow you to create realistic renderings of soft goods. Uh, both real cloth and fuzz can be used to create highly realistic representations of soft surfaces. Previously, the best way to create realistic cloth-like materials was to create them using procedural textures. You can actually see here some of our Render Weekly uh, participants and some great examples of fuzz and real cloth. I threw these up there so you guys could kind of get an idea of what you can achieve using those. Uh, procedurals can create pretty realistic looking cloth materials. However, the complexity to achieve those results is significantly higher than when using real cloth or fuzz. Uh, notice on this slide, I have two examples. The left is a great depiction of a procedural cloth set up from one of Esben Oxholm's demos versus the setup of a real cloth scene to the right. There is a clear difference in setup difficulty between the two with the real cloth material essentially being a drag and drop application. Another notable benefit of using specifically real cloth over procedurals is the increased realism at close proximity. Uh, procedurals tend to lose their realism as you get close due to the fact that procedurals rely on bump maps to imitate the negative space between threads. With real cloth applications, that is not a problem. Real cloth creates actual geometry, so the spaces between threads are empty rather than just surface depressions. Keep in mind that although real cloth is more realistic due to this geometry, uh, it will also require a significantly greater amount of computing power and most likely will cause your renders to take a lot longer. And that, that entirely depends on uh, the hardware that you're running currently. And on this slide, you can see a macro shot of a procedural weave on the top versus a macro of a real cloth weave. Uh, notice that the real cloth threads actually have dimensionality to them as well as flyaways, which really lends to the believability of the material when it's a bit zoomed out. Uh, a quick note, real cloth is incredibly useful as a soft goods material application uh, and makes realistic cloth applications extremely simple and efficient, just drag and drop, and you can adjust obviously from there. But it does require properly mapped UVs to have a successful application. If you do not have properly mapped UVs or do not want to map your UVs, an easy solution to creating soft materials is applying fuzz instead. It does not require mapped UVs for successful application and can also be applied to any subsurface material. Oh, excuse me. Using fuzz gives you greater control, flexibility, but does not create an underlying weave pattern. So do take that into account when deciding which material you're going to use. Uh, if you're interested in learning more, obviously, we're going to be talking about it at 12 p.m. Pacific today, and Soren and I will take a deep dive, so definitely tune in for that. Now that we've covered several of our advanced materials, I'd like to spend some time covering a few of the ways we can maximize our material usage and speed up our workflows by looking at Keyshot Cloud, uh, the Multi-Material tab, and editing in the Material Graph. I'm going to open up that last project so we can actually look here at the material cloud. So the, the cloud library icon is down at the bottom left of the screen. If you are interested in pulling more materials or you need models for scenes, this is a great place to look. Uh, just by clicking on that, you open it up and you have access to all kinds of materials. Uh, these materials are constantly being updated. You can actually upload materials yourself. So there's plenty of user generated materials that you can grab from. There's environments, backplates, there's HDRIs, uh, anything that has the Keyshot logo up here is certified by Keyshot. And then you also have a giant models library um, that you can pull from. And that's constantly being added to as well. Uh, many of these have been made in-house. So if you're trying to populate a scene or make something more realistic, if you're looking for a wider variety of materials to choose from, this is definitely a great starting point and I would recommend jumping in here. Pause that. All right, so some takeaways. New materials are always being added, what I was talking about a second ago, and you can upload and create your own materials as well. Uh, next, let's take a look at multi-materials uh, for quick, non-destructive material variation. I'm not going to go too in-depth since Ryan will be covering multi-materials in tomorrow morning's Keyshot Advanced Workshop, so don't miss that. But let's open up our ball over here. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this ball by now. 
Um, so what I've done is I've just drag and dropped a few plastic materials that are cloudy over here into my malt. Let me take off the noise real quick. Um, Multi-material allows you to crank out a lot of colorways without having to save out different files and worry about adjustments. It's also great because if you come over here, you have a duplicate material. So if you have a material that you've adjusted your surface textures to and you don't want to change those textures, you simply want to change the color, you just duplicate your material and you can easily change the color afterwards. So it's a great tool for really speeding up your workflow, working quickly and working smart. Um, be aware that if you do click multi-material by accident after you've done, done this, it will set whatever material you have chosen and the rest of them will disappear and you'll have to start over. So only click that if you want to do that. Otherwise, you'll experience that. And again, these are pl cloudy plastic materials. I'm currently using GPU, but if you hit denoise, right off the bat, you can see that incredible change. Like it, it has some surface texture gone, but if you give it a couple seconds, it really starts rising up. So if you're working from home and you're trying to work quick, denoise is awesome, especially with cloudy plastics and, and VDBs as well. If you're using scattering medium, uh, that's that image that Ryan Levy made with the uh, motorcycle that was done using denoise and it was incredibly fast to create that render. So definitely play with denoise and your cloudy plastics as well. All right. Some takeaways. Oh, sorry about that. All right, so we're going to talk about node based editing in the window. Uh, our material graph gives us a lot of control when working with your mater materials. You can edit many aspects using the sliders you find in the materials tab of the project panel. But to get the most control over your materials, you should be working from the material graph, uh, which is a node based editing window. And I'll talk about as been seen real quick before. So this is that image we opened up. Uh, a moment ago. And you can see here that this whole thing was made from a single material. This is the power of the material graph. You can really achieve some incredible effects uh, from the material graph. So it can get complicated, as you can see here, it's just all kinds of things plugged in. But uh, I'll jump into the material graph and I'll, I'll show you a little bit about that. We're kind of running out of time here, so I'm keeping an eye on that as well. Let's open up this guy instead. So if you go into the material graph, uh, one thing to note is that if you do have a multi-material selected, all your materials will show up on the same graph. So don't let that intimidate you. Um, they are still just one material at a time. Uh, it's really nice working from the material graph. You have similar editing capabilities as you do on the side here, but you can also, since it's a node based, you can just plug and play different things. If you right click on your workspace, you can duplicate selections, choose from materials, geometry, textures, animations, and utilities. Um, something that's really fun to play with is when you're creating bumps. Uh, let's go ahead and I think we're using the blue. So I'm gonna plug in this brush material into my bump there. And then you can start layering all kinds of, of different textures on top of that. You can right click, if you have your, your connection selected, you can right click, hit utilities and hit bump add, which gives you another control. And then you can just keep stacking uh, textures on top of one another to your heart's content, which is pretty awesome because you can, you can cr create some, oh, some pretty unique uh, material applications just by stacking. It looks like it wants to utilize my GPU here. So I'm gonna click that off. But, and you can just keep stacking textures to your, like I said, to your heart's content and do whatever you want there. Uh, you can also invert colors if you're using logos and labels. Uh, if you're trying to create fuzz, uh, this is where you would do it from. You can add flakes if you were to plug in your fuzz geometry to the surface of a material. Uh, this is where you'd be able to control it. You'd have access to all those different controls on the right hand side here. So that's, that's uh, something that you definitely want to play with if you want to increase your ability to control your materials. You have a significantly higher amount of control in this panel than you do in the project panel on the side. I know it looks intimidating, but it's really not. And in this case, it's, it's extremely oversaturated because we have the multi-material. But if I actually click that multi-material off, you see how much simpler it gets. But spend some time in here. Uh, you can really dive in and, and get crazy as you saw with Esben's 
uh, but you can also keep it simple. And I'll actually jump into this a little bit more with the fuzz and talk about density textures, length textures, and direction textures in our afternoon session. So I'll be touching on the material graph a little bit more then as well. And lastly, I just wanna talk about it real quick. Uh, lastly, I wanted to discuss how to animate your materials. Uh, animating materials can be particularly useful when creating animations that incorporate colorway options for marketing or for design reviews. Uh, they can also be effective at demonstrating how objects illuminate or buttons glow during use. There is a great uh, YouTube tutorial made by Will on illuminating LEDs. I would highly recommend checking that out if you're trying to do that. Uh, to animate your materials, you can either use a color fade or a number fade animation, depending on whether the parameter is controlled by a color or a number. Uh, both animation types can be assigned to the material graph or from one of those checkered boxes near a material input. Uh, and, and it's really useful for, especially like when you're doing colorways, it's extremely useful if you're doing an animation that involves a lot of rotations and you want the animation to kind of run through your, your colorways. But I do recommend that if you're trying to animate a stationary uh, object to run through your colorways, I think a better approach for that would be to render out the individual images in the color you want and then edit them together. Uh, it, it would require a lot more computing power and time to actually use one of those color animations to have a stationary object do it. But if you are doing an uh, animation where the object is transitioning and moving and rotating and you want the colorways, that's definitely the way to go. All right, well, thanks for sticking with me. Uh, that's it for our presentation portion of Advanced Materials. Let's go ahead and open it up for Q&A and answer some questions. Awesome, wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Green. That was very, very informative. Thank you to Soren for his uh, uh, in-depth technical review. Um, so a couple of questions here on the tune side. Um, the person's saying that they really enjoy tune. It's great for kind of conveying, as, as you were saying, sort of uh, a, a, a simpler image. It doesn't get so focused on on the material specifics, but if you have bump maps or textures, is there a way to include these inside of Tune? So can you basically have a bump map inside of the Tune shader? Well, let's open this guy up real quick. I have actually not tried doing it, but it does look like that is a possibility. So we can plug in a texture. Let's just use a noise fractal and see how that looks. It looks like it's pulling in a little bit of that information. I think adjusting that would play a big role into uh, how much you're going to see that material. But it, it, you, you can do it. It's just a matter of how much adjustment is required and based on the scale of the model that you're working with as well. Great. Uh, can Tune be applied as a cutaway part of an object is transparent? So I think... I'm not 100% sure what they're envisioning there. Hmm. Tune be applied as part. Oh, I, oh, I guess they're saying, can you basically have a cutaway inside of the tune material? So basically, could you have a cutaway tune? I think kind of almost sort of showing like a, a blueprinty like look. Yeah, I, I, it, it's a material. So as long as the material is applied, you can cut away from it. Because uh, you're cutting away through the actual object. One person is asking, when applying the tune material, the rendered image is not the same as the preview. They're having trouble getting a shadow at the fillet of the model in the rendering. Uh, that would sound like, an, an, I mean, that does not sound like it would be correct. So that would probably be an issue. Yeah, that, that may be a, something to do with the hardware. I'm actually not sure exactly about that. Um, to be as realistic as possible, can we state any real life material has subsurface scattering. Could you, could you repeat that one more time? I'm not sure I, I got that. I guess they're asking, can you, can you apply subsurface scattering to any material? I don't believe so. I'm, I'm sure there's some yeah. around that, but I, I'm, I'm, I believe the cloudy plastics are, are pretty much the only materials that and glass that you can kind of achieve that look other than using like VDBs in the actual environment. Yeah, I mean, I would grab a material that has some surface scattering and make it match what you would like there. Yeah. Um, so, and that's actually it for the questions that we have. Um, so I don't know if there's anything else uh, that you, let me see if there's any, one more coming through. 
no, that, that is the extent of the questions that we have right now. Um, okay, well, thank you everyone for, for joining today. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, at noon today, we'll have a, a session focused on um, real cloth and fuzz, as well as touching on scan materials. So that's a, a question that's come up as well from folks about how to use scan materials for things uh, such as the X-ray scanner or Vizu. Um, so that would be uh, a good session to attend as well. And a reminder, we will have a giveaway in that second uh, session uh, from the fine folks of Stanley Black and Decker who are giving away a, a cordless uh, drill combo and some heavy duty walkie talkies from DeWalt. So uh, please come back today and join us for that. Reminder as well, we'll be announcing the winner of our render contest today on Render Weekly at 3 p.m. as well as beginning a new render contest today that we're running for a week. Uh, any final uh, parting thoughts for us, Kareem? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks all again for stopping in. Uh, if you have any questions that we didn't get to or that you think of later, uh, please feel free to connect with me directly via email at kareem at luxion.com or on my LinkedIn at Kareem Merchant. And again, thanks everyone. Don't forget to tune in this afternoon. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.